Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to, to, to Uber. So uh, first of all, you know, thank you for taking the time to join us today. But before I get going, I would first like to acknowledge uh, and extend a warm welcome to all of you and our distinguished guests. Uh, first, we have Jim Zemlin here. He's the executive um, the director of the Linux Foundation. Uh, and uh, his partners in crime, uh, Mike Foster, who's chief revenue officer of Linux. Oh, he's sitting back there. Nice to meet you, Mike. And also, uh, we have the privilege of hosting four leading researchers from Taiwan uh, as part of our um, Uber Exchange program, an agreement with, uh, oh, you've moved over here now. Okay. Yep. As part of our uh, Uber Exchange program with the Ministry of Science and Technology of Taiwan. So uh, uh, welcome. Okay. Um, Uber is very proud to uh, and honored to be hosting this summit um, of open source uh, for all the contributors, users, communities, and leaders to actually meet and exchange ideas. Um, this event reflects our shared understanding of the challenges of building technology at scale and how we can all do it better if we actually do it collaboratively and to, together and share our know, technologies through open source uh, um, you know, uh, effort. Okay. Now, having been here from the very early days, I can tell you that the only way we could have built the Uber business from the very uh, um, the foundation was purely based on the, the open source technology. When I arrived here uh, five and a half years ago, we only had three dozen engineers, right? And, at the, and we couldn't have built anything at the pace and scale that we need to build to grow this business uh, without solely relying on open source technology. Right? Um, you know, Postgres, MySQL, Redis, Puppet, Kafka, Hadoop, et cetera, you name it, we probably use it. And, and, uh, and, uh, and because of that, we were able to stand on the, uh, on the shoulder of giants, right? Build on the work that actually preceded us and then add our value, okay? Now, along the way, we were fortunate enough as a company that we get to grow big, right? And uh, as part of that evolution, we actually uh, had to invent new technology to service our need as well. And since we are deeply rooted in uh, our success and our company is deeply rooted in the open source you know, um, foundation, we feel compelled to actually give back and open source a lot of the great work that we do ourselves so that we can enable the current generation of company and the future generation of company to actually move even faster than the way we have benefited from open source technology. All right, for example, uh, in the ML machine learning area, we have open source Pyros and Horovat. Uh, in data visualization, uh, we put out there Kepler's and H3. In web development, uh, we have Fusion.js. In infrastructure, uh, we had Jaeger and M3. Right? And some great hi highlight that I can call out of our open source achievement as a company um, has been um, in the, uh, the last, um, on, in the last uh, few months or so, we were recognized uh, for having Jaeger as being selected the best open source project for cloud computing in 2018. Right? And Horovat was selected as one of the best open source software mach for machine learning in 2018. Right, so a uh, great testament to you know, our effort of our engineers and also our philosophy of really you know, doing really great work and put it out there so that all of us can actually advance this, the state of the art together. Okay, uh, next I would like to introduce our uh, keynote speaker for uh, today, uh, Jim Zemlin. So Jim's career spanned three uh, of the largest technology trends to rise over the last decade, mobile computing, cloud computing, and open source software. Today, as executive director of the Linux Foundation, he uses experience to accelerate innovation in technology through the use of open source and Linux. At the Linux Foundation, Jim worked with the world's largest technology companies, including IBM, Intel, Google, Samsung, Qualcomm, and others to help define the future of computing on the servers, in the cloud, and on a variety of mobile computing devices. His work on the vendor, vendor neutral Linux Foundation give him the unique and accurate perspective on the global technology industry. Jim has been recognized for his insight on the changing economics of the technology industry, and he is a regular keynote speaker at industry events. He advises a variety of startups, including Splashtop, and sits on the boards of Global Economic Symposium, Open Source for America, and Chinese Open Source Promotion Union. I give you Jim. Thank you very much. All right, I hope I can live up to that intro. Um, 
I'm super happy to be at Uber today for so many reasons. First of all, because you're a neighbor of mine. I live in uh, Alamo Square, just up the hill from your uh, main office down in Mid Market. And uh, thanks to uh, Uber, my neighborhood now has so many more restaurants to choose from. I'm so very grateful for that. Uh, but today, uh, I'm also excited because usually I give like very short speeches. Uh, everyone has adopted sort of a TED Talk forum uh, format uh, these days. And I'm going to be able to talk a little bit longer with all of you about how uh, different organizations, developers, industries from around the world are leveraging uh, open source to achieve just an amazing change in the way that technology is built uh, and then in uh, you know innovating in, in really impactful ways uh, that impact people's daily lives. So I'll start with uh, <clears throat> telling you a little bit about the Linux Foundation uh, itself. Uh, we are obviously home to Linux. This is uh, a stunningly successful uh, software effort. Uh, I met my uh, now wife 13 years ago. We had a blind date. Uh, and uh, on that date, she asked me what I do for a living. And I told her I worked at this nonprofit foundation that gives away uh, software. And uh, the look of disappointment on her face, pretty palpable. Uh, but since then, uh, Linux has really just come to dominate uh, every form of computing. Um, whether it's Uber building uh, the platform that you have to enable uh, transportation all over the world or GoPro that didn't need to create their own operating system for their consumer devices or many of the other uh, implementations that you see highlighted here, Linux just continues to grow and dominate every single sector uh, of computing. A crazy stat about Linux is that it's changes. <clears throat> there are 10,000 uh, lines of code added to about 8,000 lines of code removed from uh, and about 5,000 lines of code changed in Linux every single day, every day. It changes nine times an hour. It's insane, it's the fastest uh, and continues to be the fastest velocity software development project in the world. Uh, but since uh, uh, 13 years ago, the Linux Foundation has also expanded into other areas of technology, uh, whether it's cybersecurity, networking, cloud computing, automotive, you name it. Uh, you, you may be surprised to find out that we're home to the world's largest certificate authority, uh, Let's Encrypt. So Let's Encrypt is a free TLS certificate authority. Uh, just app get Let's Encrypt. It makes it super easy to secure your website. Uh, we're trying to basically create uh, TLS uh, as the de facto uh, standard for all web traffic, which will make all of our lives more private uh, and make the internet uh, more secure. We have networking initiatives uh, that are helping automate the world's uh, largest service providers that serve over 3 billion users worldwide. Uh, in cloud computing, how many people have heard of Kubernetes? Anyone? All right, it's the, it's the hottest, fastest growing open source project right now. I literally just got off a plane from uh, Shanghai where we had uh, 2,700 developers uh, for our Cloud Native Computing Foundation uh, event there. Uh, interesting thing about cloud computing is we're now seeing not only uh, with Kubernetes the move towards this uh, container microservice based uh, infrastructure and development approach, but actually we're seeing homegrown projects in the Cloud Native Computing Foundation coming out of places like China. Uh, no longer is the West the only place that are creating open source projects, uh, but now there are new ones coming out uh, of places in uh, Asia, particularly in China. We also have initiatives in automotive, uh, blockchain, uh, embedded systems, and edge computing. And then uh, Node.js, I'm sure most people know of, is another project that's home uh, at the uh, Linux Foundation. Uh, we really are, if, if you think of it, a market maker for technology. What we do is build ecosystems that impact how developers create code and how users actually use that code uh, in whatever they do. And we were really proud last year to be sort of honored from the SD Times, which is an influential magazine here in uh, Silicon Valley, uh, about our role as an influencer. What, what's really interesting here is to see three of these companies that really are influencing the future of tech are open source based, GitHub, Red Hat, and the Linux Foundation. I'm proud to say that the Linux Foundation is the only independent company standing still. Uh, a year later, both Red Hat and GitHub have been acquired uh, since this award happened. Uh, unfortunately, we're a nonprofit, so no one's gonna buy the Linux Foundation anytime soon. Uh, we have thousands of uh, 
organizations who work with us. We're adding a new member every single day. Tens of thousands of developers work on Linux Foundation projects, and we create billions and billions of dollars in shared value uh, in, uh, in our uh, organization. And so you kind of look at all of this, and the big question that I think people ask me all the time is, how does a software organization like the Linux Foundation become so impactful, so successful? We only employ one developer. Now, he isn't actually a very good developer. It's Linus Torvalds. He still works at the Linux Foundation, and uh, he didn't just write Linux. He wrote Git as well. That's like two holes in one in golf, right? This guy is actually a very prolific developer. But how do we do it? We don't even have any developers. And I would actually ask the same question to this audience. How does Uber become such an important transportation company without any cars? And I think that's the insight, is that we, I, it's, it's, we have a great affinity with organizations like Uber, because I think Uber, similar to the Linux Foundation, understands the power of community, understands the power of platforms, understands the power of demand-side economics versus supply-side economics. And that has really changed the world. You know, whether it's the work that you do at Uber or, you know, uh, Alibaba is, is just a great example. Do you know that they transacted $33 billion worth of commerce in one day just uh, about a week ago on November 11th, Singles Day in China? $33 billion. They did more in one hour than Amazon will do all day on Cyber Monday. It's amazing. Because they understand the power of networks, because they understand the power of communities. It's amazing. And we're proud uh, today to announce that uh, Uber is joining the Linux Foundation uh, at our gold level. And, uh, and we are excited about the opportunity of uh, collaborating more uh, with uh, Uber on the open source projects that are already out there. We're already working with you on things like Jaeger. Uh, which is just an amazing project, but on more projects over a long period of time so that we can help Uber uh, to bring more developers into the projects that you care about so that we can uh, help promote the concept of community development uh, with you and with the thousands of other organizations we work with. So we're very happy. Welcome uh, to the Linux Foundation family. Thank you so much. So of course, the first question I get is like, how do you do all this without any engineers? The second question I get is, how can you make money with open source if you give everything away? And again, that was my, my wife's first question uh, back uh, 13 years ago. Uh, and I thought it would be worth spending a little bit of time on that today. Uh, and I, I like to think of it in 2018 to answer the how do you make money on open source by talking about the Torvalds effect. Just this year, in 2018, two organizations directly based literally directly based on code that Linus Torvalds created, uh, were acquired for a collective $40 billion in value. That is uh, a daunting amount of money. Do you know that uh, the three founders of GitHub own more stock in Microsoft as individuals than Satya Nadella, the CEO? The, the only individual shareholder in Microsoft that owns more stock is Bill Gates. Uh, the three, uh, the, the third, second, third, fourth uh, shareholders are the three founders of GitHub. That's how valuable uh, the Microsoft found uh, GitHub and uh, open source. But it's not just projects based on Linus. Just, this is just in 2018. Look at the amount of commercial outcomes based on open source software, a collective $65 billion in market capitalization. That is a, a stunning amount uh, of money. Uh, and I hope it uh, addresses the issue of how you make money uh, on open source. And remember, this is just direct monetization. This doesn't include any of the indirect value being created by being able to have Uber create your network very quickly by leveraging billions of dollars worth of shared code that existed when the company was founded. You know, Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg often talks about how uh, important developers were to the early days of Facebook and how they just couldn't have built Facebook without open source software. You know, they didn't need to license anything. They just grabbed Linux and MySQL and a bunch of open source code and just built the company. 
really, really quickly. We're actually even seeing M&A of open source projects themselves, where companies go in and, and buy an entire open source project. Uh, now, this generally is a, when you have a small project that's owned by a single individual. Uh, the Linux Foundation projects uh, are not for sale. Uh, unfortunately for me, fortunately, probably for everybody else. But I think it's interesting to see that uh, amount of value uh, people are, are creating here. Now, the question is, why is open source so valuable? Why is it creating so much value? And then how does it work today? And there's just a super easy way to think about this if you're not a developer. I think most developers generally understand this. But today, creating applications is like create, making a sandwich, right? Uh, think of it as an open source sandwich. So you choose a framework, React, Node.js, right? You then write your code. You're building some application to do something, right? This is the code that actually matters to you. This is the code that matters to your customer. You then go and use a bunch of open source libraries to uh, implement that code. You know, why would you go write all this stuff yourself if it already exists in NPM land or, or anywhere else? Uh, and when you look at the total amount of code in any average uh, software application these days, you know, 90% of it's just open source, you know. But the key thing for, for all of you to understand is that 10% of the code that you write yourselves is the code that actually matters to your customers, to your company, and to yourself, right? Uh, and this is just how software is being written these days. And the testimony to that is the fact that open source is accelerating on every metric of growth. These numbers are already like sadly outdated. I think there's now 78 million repositories in GitHub, and this is less, less than one year old. Just Millions of open source developers creating billions of lines of code, creating tens of thousands of new packages and, and versions every single day uh, is an amazing pace of development. Now, the problem for all of you is when you're choosing a framework, when you're looking for a library, the question is, out of the 64 million repos out there, which one do I pick? Which one should I bet my career, my company, my future on? That's the question. Uh, the, the, all this abundance has actually created anxiety. There's this great book called The Paradox of Choice where uh, a study was done about happiness and uh, how it relates to choice. Most people think like, hey, if I have more to choose from, I'm gonna be super happy. And uh, the author of this book went and studied people in America who would go into you know, shopping centers and grocery stores and there's 50 different kinds of potato chips and it actually made them less happy, all that choice, because it created anxiety. Like, am I choosing the right thing, right? And there's really, people struggle with this, right? It, you have to answer a bunch of questions. There, there's this debate of like, you know, open versus closed, fragmented versus integrated, of speed and velocity versus uh, refinement and integration, right? And open source alone has, you know, uh, has some problems that I think we all have to acknowledge. Uh, I think secure cybersecurity is certainly a challenge. Uh, I don't think that is limited uh, to uh, open source uh, alone, but is the project secure? Does the project have velocity? Am I picking the right framework? Is this something I can bet my future on? You know, am I a, a Go developer? Am I a Java developer? Am I a JavaScript developer? What's the future? Will there be job opportunities? Can I depend on this for long periods of time? Will it be secure? These are tough questions. And so, the number one trend we're seeing to answer these questions out there uh, answers this simple question. If 90% of the code in any software product, service, technology that you create comes from outside of your organization, how are you managing external R&D? The top 10 technology companies in the world spend more than $46 billion a year on internal R&D. Yet 90% of the code in their products and services doesn't come from those R&D organizations. It comes from outside of the company itself. It comes from open source projects that are used to create all these technology products and services. And so what we've seen at the Linux Foundation is the rise of the open source program office. I mean, Uber today is another good example of an organization that is forward thinking, that understands the value of managing this effectively. Think about it. How can I choose which code to leverage, bring it into the organization, 
integrate that code into my development process? How do I share back code that I don't want to maintain myself? How do I share what I want to share, keep what I want to keep, how do I comply with the legal obligations of the intellectual property licenses that govern open source? And many, 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 many more decisions have to be made every time you uh, go through an open source decision process as an organization. And what we've seen is internet scale companies have really pioneered uh, this approach. Uh, Google is probably one of the best examples, uh, Facebook, Netflix as well, of where they've built open source program offices over uh, time. Um, but it's not just them. Uh, traditional uh, companies are also building open source program offices. Samsung, Intel, Autodesk, these are just traditional tech companies that have large groups who manage this external R&D. Legal, engineering, product management, even marketing, developer relations, human resources, all participate in this effort. Uh, we see uh, startups building open source program offices. Uber, uh, a good example of that. I don't know that we would count you as a startup anymore these days, but uh, it's pretty impressive. Uh, even Microsoft, like I never thought I'd see the day uh, where Microsoft would be a top member of the Linux Foundation participating uh, in every single uh, project uh, that we work on, uh, acquiring GitHub, uh, building an open source program office. Uh, it is a, a crazy world that we live on that, that uh, open source has made that change. Even governments uh, are adopting open source program uh, offices. Uh, and companies are also even creating uh, a open source CTO title, executive open source leads within their organizations. VMware uh, has a chief uh, technology officer for open source. Uh, that is a position that is a very senior position there. That's how important it is to them. So the question then, for, that I got a lot uh, from, from folks uh, here at Uber and others is then, okay, I understand the open source program office, I understand there's a lot of open source, what does the Linux Foundation actually do? You seem to be accomplishing a lot, but how do you actually do it? And the easy way to think about how organizations like ours work together with Uber is to think of us as an innovation engine. We take projects that maybe Uber creates or co-creates with other organizations. Those projects create solutions or products in the market those products are adopted for commercial use. They, generally, the stuff we work on is not stuff that's used by hobbyists. They're mainly used by uh, folks for commercial use. Certainly, hobbyists can use any of the code. There's no obligation uh, for anyone to, to you know, uh, join our organization or uh, participate in projects to use the code. But generally, they're used for commercial products. And each of those products create profit, create value. And the profit from that a monetization of open source gets reinvested back into the project, largely in the form of developers. It's not revenue that goes to the Linux Foundation, we're like a tiny company, but largely the reinvestment in Linux is in the form of an Intel or a Google or a Facebook engineer who's contributing code back to Linux. And that reinvestment in the form of development begets a better Linux kernel, a faster version of Linux, maybe a version that consumes less power, so your data center is cheaper to run, and that begets more solutions, that gets more profit, that gets more reinvestment in the project, and you have this virtuous cycle. Project, product, profit, project, product, profit, and they're mutually reinforcing each other. That is what all open source projects strive to do. The open source projects that you can count on, the open source projects you wanna bet your company on, are the ones that enter into that positive feedback loop of project, product, profit. And so we have a methodology that we've developed over a long period of time to accelerate that virtuous cycle. Working with organizations like Uber to identify collective value for a particular code base that you want to co-develop with somebody else. We'll create an infrastructure and governance model to make decisions about the technology itself. We'll help provide a legal framework, whether it's the, a license, trademark, patent regime for those. Uh, that will then be used to bring other folks to the table. 
Uh, the Linux Foundation is one of the world's largest developer relations organizations. We, our events attract 35,000 developers worldwide every single year across 41 countries uh, and 150 events. Uh, we have lots of developer engagement programs that will bring people to this collective product code base and help them commit to it. We build documentation out so that we can get people more productive on these code bases faster. We do training in order to get more human capital into Kubernetes or into things like Jaeger more quickly. Um, we manage all of the infrastructure for this code development. Uh, and what this does is it creates a diverse set of community participants committed long term to an upstream project that will then allow those participants to create commercial solutions. Now, this is where Uber comes in, right? You have an open source program office that can help all the different business groups within Uber understand how to consume and create value from open source, right? How to identify an opportunity for maybe co-development, how to bring code in, adopt it, how to manage the intellectual property process, how to share back, how to make sure that, again, Uber keeps the valuable intellectual property you want to keep and shares what you want to share. Nobody expects Uber to share every single thing about your organization to open source your entire code base. You have to think strategically about this, about what is of value to share and what's of value to keep. And then we teach you how to upstream that uh, and provide feedback in terms of how to improve those upstream projects even further. This year, one of the things that we've been doing uh, is the final step, which is to show organizations and measure the collective value of all of this work. So we are working with the world so that they can understand how value gets captured in open source software. One of the big challenges that we always have at the Linux Foundation is that engineers come to us all the time saying, oh, my management just doesn't get it. They don't understand like my world and how important it would be for me to be able to share this code and have people co-create it. And they don't understand that, you know, giving away the software would actually create more profit and more value for the company versus less value for the company. I mean, I get this all the time. And so we are creating a bunch of research at the foundation, many, many, much of it available on our website, uh, to show how value gets captured in these big uh, open source uh, ecosystems. So that's what we do. That's how open source is working today. But I think it would be helpful for all of you to really understand how this works if we look at some examples of, of actually how the Linux Foundation has worked with thousands of companies to solve some pretty big uh, challenges uh, over a, a long period of time. And this will give you some examples of being, uh, that, that will show you how to answer the question, you know, why, why would we open source this stuff? Why would we want to give away something that we worked really hard uh, on doing that? And so th this is just, I'll show you maybe four or five patterns that we see uh, organizations doing in terms of making a decision to participate in open source. The first and, and, and easiest explanation for why you would want to use open source is you know, this code is not my competitive secret sauce. This is something that everybody has to do in a pre-competitive way. And boy, I would like to avoid duplicate effort and I would like to make the infrastructure software uh, that's really more on the cost side of my business cheaper so that I can create more value on the profit side uh, of the ledger. And uh, a good example of uh, avoiding duplicate effort and commoditizing R&D is a project we just announced this summer uh, with the Motion Picture Academy uh, in Hollywood uh, with the film industry. So uh, how many people here uh, and know the Academy, the Motion Picture Academy? Yeah. How many people know the Oscars? It's the home to the Oscars. The, the, the only reason we did this project is because I wanted to get into the Oscars somehow. Just like even a seat filler position, I'll take it. It doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, we were approached by some of the major film studios and the Academy. I'd like to start by thanking the Academy for their work. They hate that joke, by the way. Uh, the, the, the film studios came to us and said, listen, the top 134 Four most profitable films ever. All of them are driven by animation and computer graphics. 
Do you know what 135 is? It's Mamma Mia. It's like the most profitable live action movie ever, right? Uh, but all the rest of them are all uh, driven by animation CGI. And what happens in the movie industry is you build up a huge production pipeline for the movie that you're, built, you're creating this that time, and you make the movie, and then you tear it all down, and then you set it all up again the next movie, and a different version this time, and different components, and maybe more modern hardware. Uh, and that happens within studios, and that happens across studios. For stuff that just doesn't matter to the studios. Uh, not to say that uh, the, the computer graphics components uh, of those films aren't important, but at the end of the day, movie companies are storytelling companies. They're not necessarily technology companies. Technology is a critical core component of their business. It's the most profitable driven component of their business. But you don't go to a movie just because they have good graphics. You want to have a good story. And this is the, what the Academy and the film industry gets. So we worked with them for two solid years to talk to every studio lead, every studio attorney working through the Academy to help them understand how they could share what they want to share and keep what they want to keep. Intellectual property is really important to the film industry, and they needed to understand how co-creation of code wouldn't undermine their core intellectual property itself. Uh, Rob Brito, who's the CTO of uh, Lucasfilm and the president of Industrial Light and Magic, uh, really drove a lot of this work with the Academy. Uh, and uh, we've just started to have releases of some of the production pipeline code for that uh, initiative. And I think Rob said it best uh, the other day uh, where he said that, listen, this is how industrial light and magic is going to find engineers. We're not only solving a problem of duplicate effort and high cost, but if you want to get into the film industry, if you're a developer who really wants to get their foot in the door in Hollywood, go participate in these open source projects. They will actively recruit developers uh, out of that world. And, you know, it may surprise you, but the film industry actually has a tough time recruiting top tech talent uh, because companies like Uber tend to do a better job. Uh, so watch out. The film industry may be going after some of your folks. Uh, but that's not the only case. Here's another example of it wasn't uh, for duplicate effort, but really a matter of an entire industry not seeing the innovation that they needed out of their supply chain. So this is an example of uh, the telecommunications sector uh, being essentially locked into a fairly small uh, set of suppliers who were providing the telecommunications infrastructure to run their production networks. Companies like AT&T, China Mobile, Orange, uh, Bell Canada, and so forth. Uh, you know, Think of them as the phone companies. I mean, obviously, they're much more than phone companies these days. They're integrated telecommunications and uh, uh, internet data center and service providers. But these are the folks who run the production networks for billions of mobile phone subscribers and internet users every single day. And they had this huge problem where 5G is coming and they need to connect you know, a thousand times more endpoints, maybe more than that, tens of thousands of times more endpoints, where the use of data is increasing on their networks exponentially. And they realize that unless they automate their networks, they're never gonna get to where they need to be in terms of serving their customers. They needed to move from a hardware infrastructure to a software-defined infrastructure to an automated infrastructure in a short period of time. And they just weren't getting what they needed. And so John Donovan, the president of AT&T, uh, and other uh, folks uh, throughout the world decided, we're gonna go use open source to create software-defined networking for our network infrastructure, to build network function virtualization for routers and firewalls and other components within their network, and we're gonna do it in open source. Uh, the Linux Foundation worked with China Mobile and AT&T and all these companies to come together on a single code base uh, just on the orchestration layer. There's other components all the way down to data plane services uh, to help them automate these networks. Those organizations today will be able to get to market faster and save billions of dollars by co-creating in this way.
And the funny sort of side effect of this is their vendors suddenly started getting enthusiastic about faster innovation, started getting uh, more aggressive about how they price their products and services, uh, and actually started participating in this open source uh, community as well so that they could actually create more profit for their vendor communities in addition to servicing their customers better. And that's a really effective use case for strategically using open source. Now the next one here uh, is another uh, easy example and maybe uh, my friends at Google wouldn't like the way that I uh, characterize this, but uh, they, they basically, there's this sort of, uh, uh, sort of equalizing component of open source uh, that a lot of folks like to leverage. And it's really, you know, uh, to become number one in, in a tech industry is, is a humongous uh, thing. Micro, think of Microsoft as the best example of this, where they just created this de facto standard for operating system software, Everyone who wanted to develop code for the PC had to come license Windows, had to use you know, Visual Studio and uh, MSDN uh, tools and so forth. And becoming that de facto lock-in standard, the number one, is massively valuable. You know, like if you can do it, go for it. But everybody else does not like that at all, right? Users don't like it because they're locked into a de facto standard. Competitors don't like it because they get killed. Uh, and so having a level playing field and using open source to do it has become a modern practice in order to uh, balance out competition within uh, the tech industry. And our Cloud Native Computing Foundation is a very, very good example of that, where Google and others uh, saw that cloud computing could be a future form of lock-in for technology if just one or two organizations became the de facto standard for public cloud services. And so one of the things that they also realized is that uh, deploying just virtual machines in a public cloud and lifting and shifting infrastructure that way uh, wasn't effectively good way to build cloud-based applications and certainly wasn't a way that uh, Google uh, knew how to do it. Uh, Google's entire infrastructure is actually based on uh, containers uh, and uh, modern uh, cloud native development techniques that they pioneered many, many years ago. Uh, and they wanted to see the whole world shift to that model so that we had a more efficient way to build applications in the cloud. So they approached the foundation in 2015, uh, contributed Kubernetes, uh, which was roughly based on the uh, infrastructure software, the Borg that uh, uh, Google uses to run all of their modern infrastructure, uh, and, and gave that to the world uh, in exchange for making a more even playing field. And when people got their hands on that code and saw the power of the development model of cloud native, of microservices, of container technology, of being able to do continuous integration, continuous development, I mean, everyone immediately realized how powerful this could be. And we saw hundreds of organizations start to come in and co-develop on Kubernetes, on things like Jaeger, uh, and the collection of technologies within the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Today, there are 333 companies participating in it. Today, we have 79 Kubernetes certified uh, providers out there. All major cloud service providers provide a Kubernetes service. I mean, this is a home run in terms of how open source has been used to create a level playing field in cloud computing. This is our fastest growing, one of our most powerful organizations. You are gonna see more and more interesting technology coming out of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation along all the different aspects of managing a modern development production pipeline. Finally, <clears throat> we one of the other examples that we have at the foundation that I think is interesting to Uber is uh, the automotive sector. So I, I gave a speech many years ago at the Detroit Auto Show. This, was, this is the big event for all the car makers uh, every year in Detroit. And the speech went along the lines of, you know, you have new competition in the auto sector. And it's for the, the vehicle experience, for how you experience your car. It is the merger of a piece of Velcro and an iPad. How many people here use their phone or their iPad rather than the, the car navigation system when you're driving? How many people here think your car navigation system actually sucks? All right. It's a problem for the car makers. <laughs> they, uh, and uh, I kind of got laughed out of the room. You know, like, oh, no, no, no. People want uh, better looking cars. They want fuel efficiency. Uh, but 
uh, Kenny Shmorata, who uh, is uh, uh, the guy who runs the software and, and connected vehicle group at Toyota, came up to me and said, listen, I want to talk about this. He kind of let me in on the secrets of car companies, which I think Uber probably knows since you're in uh, 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 an analogous field. Uh, he said, you know, we don't really have a lot of software developers. Like car companies are supply chain, you know, sort of operators. They, they have a massive supply chain who build the different components of the car and then they assemble them and understand what their users want, what their customers want. Um, but what he could see is that if the auto sector did not build software expertise quickly, they would lose control of that in-vehicle experience. And, you know, eight, nine years later, the number one purchasing criteria for cars these days is the software. It's the in-vehicle experience that you get through the software that consumers really, really want. They want those advanced connectivity features. They want advanced navigation features. They want better uh, ways to communicate through their car. They want their car to connect with their home, with their office, with the rest of their lives. And so we created Automotive Grade Linux with uh, a bunch of OEMs. Initially, just five of the uh, top 10 automakers uh, got aligned on this and created an open source reference platform uh, for them, uh, or with them, I should say. Uh, went and recruited all their tier ones and tier twos to go, uh, uh, suppliers to go and co-create this software. Helped build a talent pool uh, with the automakers of trained software developers that they could hire directly to help work on the software in their vehicles. This is sort of the reference platform that 90% of the code that doesn't matter to them competitively what the automakers focus on is the 10% of the code that really is the vehicle experience, how they connect the different subsystems of the car together to have this really interesting integrated experience within the vehicle, uh, how they can connect the vehicle to other things. And it's been really effective. Um, already, this is in production in uh, millions of automobiles. Uh, we're seeing it uh, used in advanced transportation systems. Uh, for example, Daimler is using this uh, in Europe in their commercial vans that actually have drones uh, that come out of the van to deliver things in uh, neighborhoods. They integrate the system in with those UAVs. Uh, they actually, more funnily, we have an initiative at the Linux Foundation called Drone Code. So it's the combination of two open source projects, Drone Code, which manages the UAV software and the automotive system, which uh, connects to that to uh, provide the commercial delivery services for the uh, Daimler vehicles in Europe. Um, but we are seeing more and more OEMs participate uh, in this. And we're really uh, glad to see we've been able to use open source to create uh, a, a level playing field uh, against what was really a big concern and continues to be for the automakers. Uh, the final thing uh, I'd like to, to talk to you about isn't something that's specific to a competitive issue or a monetization issue, uh, but it's something that is important to all of our collective privacy and security from a cyber perspective. And one of the things that open source is really good at is being, because all the code is public, is being able to apply collective leverage to solve tough problems. And today, cybersecurity is one of the toughest problems that society uh, really faces. Uh, it's uh, been something that's impacted our electoral system, as you've seen in the news lately, uh, has resulted in the privacy of millions of people being disclosed uh, wantonly over the internet, uh, and billions of dollars worth of theft and fraud uh, worldwide. And cybersecurity problems tend to come from uh, something really simple that I think any of you as developers would understand, just bugs in software, just software that wasn't written properly or didn't have cybersecurity in mind from the get-go, creates a vulnerability, hackers exploit it, and it creates billions in damages. So one of the things we're working on through a project that we have called the Core Infrastructure Initiative is trying to identify uh, the most important shared software, the most important open source software in the world. We're working with uh, Harvard University's Lab for Innovation Science to catalog what is the software that is used in production by banks, by transportation companies, by uh, supply chain companies, by government and so forth. And we want to be specific, package, version number, what is the actual code? We want to figure out who writes that code. Is it a big community? Is it a small community? Then we want to find out why they wrote it. Is that their job to write it? 
Are they just doing it as volunteers? Nobody knows. But then the last question is, is it secure? And I, I can tell you that when you look specifically and deeply into this issue, you find some surprising things. I mean, the, the best example of this is how many people remember the OpenSSL heart bleed bug? Did anybody here patch that on any of the Uber systems? Have to go and do the thankless job of patching tons of servers? It's to, it, this wasted hundreds and hundreds of millions of in dollars in productivity just remediating it, but probably much more than that in terms of the vulnerability uh, and exposure it created for uh, private uh, systems. And when we looked into the OpenSSL project, where, where the heartbreak vulnerability came from, we found Steve Henson and Steve Marquez. So these two folks had been working on the OpenSSL pro project for a long time, and they were kind of the only people who had consistently been working on it for a long period of time. This was back, I think, three years ago, 2015. Think about that. When Heartbleed happened in 2015, the world's internet, the lockbox on your browser, was being maintained by two guys named Steve. The Steves were basically securing the internet. I mean, this is a large-scale systemic problem that affects all of us. And so what we did is we provided some financial resources to the Steves. Uh, we helped refactor some of the code. We audited that code for uh, security. Uh, we went and helped them refactor the code, provided better tools for testing and so forth. And we'd love to do that for many, many, many more projects. We have to collectively identify where systemic vulnerabilities are in software and go and fix them. And that's the purpose of this particular effort. And that's something that I think is bigger than just, you know, a competitive advantage or leveling a playing field or, you know, getting to market faster. It's about the privacy and security of the globe uh, when it relates to cybersecurity. So the final thing I'll leave you with is just what's coming up. Uh, we've got a bunch of new programs uh, at the foundation that we'd love to have folks from Uber participate in. Uh, in artificial intelligence, we have uh, our Linux Foundation Deep Learning Initiative. Uh, we've got uh, projects in there that really want to solve a simple problem. How do we make it easier for folks to build uh, AI applications to train ML models to, to get, get them into production faster and cheaper? with less dependency on super high-end data scientists and just really give those tools to almost anyone so they can get to value faster. We're working with some of the world's largest energy providers to create uh, open source tools to automate uh, managing the electrical grids in places like Europe. Uh, we hope that will have a meaningful impact on climate change by reducing uh, the amount of power uh, through software automation of their electrical grids. In edge computing, we have tools to provide the infrastructure that's gonna be needed for low latency applications like autonomous vehicle control and others. We have a project called Chaos, Community Health for Open Source Software. Uh, this is to go and make sure that we know what projects uh, are thriving and what are hurting so we can help improve them. And then on open source uh, software uh, management, we have an open chain project that helps organizations make sure that open source is efficiently flowing through their supply chain. A project called SPDX, which provides an automated software bill of materials so you know what open source you're actually running in your system. Uh, and then the two group, two group, which is a group of open source program office managers from all of the organizations I highlighted earlier that are working together to develop these processes to manage open source. Uh, these are the things I'm talking about publicly but most of my job is spent working with entirely new industries to bring open source value to them. Uh, and then we announce them when they wanna talk publicly about how they're gonna do that. And you know, that's really the, the, the powerful thing that's happening in open source today. It used to be that we measured the success of open source by the number of developers. You know, by if we got just a few more developers in Linux, we would do so much better. And then if we got 100 more developers, we'd do even so much better. Today, we look at it by wholesale vertical industries. How can we help the energy sector automate the way that power gets managed across the world, reduce the impact that utility providers have on climate change? How do we work with financial services companies to help provide better transparency? How do we work with governments to provide more transparency in government, better land registration, identity systems, to make it more efficient? Those are the things that I think open source is gonna impact in the next decade. And we're very happy 
to be here at Uber and to partner with all of you uh, to help make that impact, both for Uber uh, and for the rest of the world. So thank you all very much. Thank you.